Sugar molecules, also known as saccharides or carbohydrates, are biological molecules, biomolecules that play a very important role in our body as well as the bodies of other animals and plant structures. So basically plants take the energy that is stored in sunlight and transform water and carbon dioxide into the sugar molecules and when we ingest those sugar molecules we can then break down those sugar molecules and take the energy and use that energy to power the different types of processes that take place inside our body. So one role that is played by sugar molecules is to store energy. Now in this lecture we're going to begin our discussion on sugars, we're going to focus on the nomenclature, the way that we name our sugar molecules, we're going to discuss the Fisher projection, the way that we depict the three-dimensional structure of our sugar molecules, we're also going to discuss the DL isomers and we're going to see how to calculate the total number of stereoisomers in any given sugar molecule. So let's begin by describing the simplest type of sugar molecule known as glyceraldehyde. So glyceraldehyde basically contains three carbon atoms, one of which is a stereogenic carbon. So remember, stereogenic carbon is any carbon that is attached to four different groups. And so, stereogenic carbons are chiral. They, they have R absolute configuration or they can have the S absolute configuration. Now, our simplest sugar, the glyceride, is part of a category of sugars known as the aldotriose. And this is basically how we name our sugars. So the aldo part of our word means we're dealing with an aldehyde. So on one section of that sugar chain, we have an aldehyde. The tri means that we have three carbons total inside our molecule and the OSE is something that we're going to discuss in just a moment. So the aldo implies that we have an aldehyde group while the tri means we have a total of three carbons inside our molecule. Now, if the aldo is replaced with keto, that means the aldehyde is replaced with the ketone group. So we can also have, for example, the keto triose in which we have three carbons, but the aldehyde has been replaced with the ketone group. So let's examine the stereochemistry, the structure of our simplest sugar, the glyceraldehyde, which looks something like this. So we have our stereogenic carbon that is is described using the asterisk. On one side we have the H and our hydroxyl. On the other end we have this aldehyde as well as the primary alcohol. So basically on one end of the sugar we have our aldehyde. On the other end of the sugar we have the primary alcohol and in between we have this carbon that contains on one end the H, on the other end our hydroxyl group. Now this particular molecule has the R stereochemistry, so it's the R enantiomer. And if we take the mirror image of this molecule, we obtain the other enantiomer, the S enantiomer, in which this has S absolute configuration. Now, this is the simplest sugar which contains a minimum of three carbons. So the simplest sugar contains at least three carbons. What if we bump up our carbons to four carbons or five or six carbons? How exactly will the structure and the name of our sugar change. So basically tri means we're dealing with three carbons. So triose means three carbons. If we have four carbons, we replace triose with tetrose. If we have five, we replace it with pentose. If we have six, we replace it with hexose and so forth. For example, let's suppose we draw our diagram for our glyceraldehyde, the aldotriose, on a two-dimensional board. The structure looks something like this. 
we have the stereogenic carbon that is attached to our aldehyde on one end the other end we have the primary alcohol and on the sides we have an H as well as our hydroxyl now if we take the aldo tetros which has one more carbon we basically add this additional group inside our molecule in between our aldehyde and the primary alcohol so we still have the aldehyde we have one of these groups but we have additional group another group as shown so now instead of having one stereogenic carbon we have two stereogenic carbons and to the end we have this primary alcohol now if we look at the aldopentose we add one more uh, CHOH group and so instead of having two or one as in this case we have one two three stereogenic carbon so we have one two three carbons all together and one stereogenic carbon here we have one two three four uh, total carbons and only two stereogenic carbons here we have one two three four five total carbons and only one two three stereogenic carbons so each time we increase a carbon we basically increase the number of stereogenic carbons that we have and that will become an important role as we'll see when we discuss how to calculate the total number of stereoisomers for any given sugar molecule now also notice that our aldo sugars as well as keto sugars are always drawn with the aldehyde group on one end and the primary alcohol on the other group so on the other end so on on the top end we have our aldehyde on the bottom end we always draw the primary alcohol now this is one method of describing the two-dimensional structure of sugars but how can we describe the three-dimensional structure of our sugar molecules so one very common way is to use something called the Fisher projection which is basically a stereochemical convention in which we can transform the two-dimensional structure of sugar into its three-dimensional counterpart so to see how to actually use the Fisher projection let's take a look at the simplest molecule our aldotriose and let's transform it using this convention the Fisher projection into its three-dimensional counterpart so basically we take our molecule and the bonds the lines which represent the bonds that are horizontal those are made to come out of the board and the bonds that are vertical the lines that are vertical those are made to go into the board so the horizontal lines are drawn coming out of the board while the vertical lines are made to go into the board so this is our Fisher projection. We can do the same exact thing with the aldotetros and the aldopentones. And, and we'll do many more examples uh, in the next several lectures. So now let's go on to basically define what our ending of the aldotriose means. What exactly do we mean by the OSE? So notice that in any one of our aldose molecules, in the aldotriose, the aldotetros, and the aldopentose, we have these carbon HOH groups separating the aldehyde and our primary alcohol. So in each one, we have a longer series of chains. Now this, gr these groups basically designate the OSE. So the OSE part of the aldo triose or any other aldose means that the aldehyde at one end is connected to the primary alcohol at the other end via a series of CHOH groups so in this case we have one such group in this case we have two such groups in this case we have three such groups in the next one in line the aldohexose we're going to have four and so forth now 
many many of these molecules have different types of stereoisomers so one important stereoisomer that is very common is the d and l isomer so if the hydroxyl group the oh group that is found on the last stereogenic carbon so next to our primary alcohol group so in this case it's this oh in this case it's this oh and in this case it's this oh if that OH group is found on the right side, then we have a D isomer, a D sugar. If the OH group is found on the left side, then that is known as the L sugar. So to see what we mean, let's take an example for aldotriose. So on, on our aldotriose, our OH can either be found on the right or the OH can be found on the left. If it's found on the right, it's called the D glyceraldehyde. If it's found on the left, it's called the L glyceraldehyde. Now the D is simply our R enantiomer, while our L is simply our S enantiomer. Now, in the same way that R or S doesn't necessarily tell us anything about the way that our molecule rotates plain polarized light, note that D and L have nothing to do with how a given molecule, a given sugar, actually rotates plain polarized light. So that implies that D sugars can rotate either the positive or our negative direction. The positive means counterclockwise and negative means counterclockwise. So if we know that our sugar is a D sugar, we have no way of knowing if it rotates plain polarized light in one direction or the other just from this information. However, if we know, for example, that D sugar rotates in the positive direction, then that means the L must rotate in the counterclockwise, the negative direction. Likewise, if we know that D rotates in the negative direction, direction, then the L must rotate in the positive direction. Now, the last thing that I want to discuss in this lecture is how to calculate the total number of different stereoisomers of any given sugar molecule knowing the total number of stereogenic carbons. So we basically have a formula. If a given sugar contains n number of stereogenic carbons, then the total number of stereoisomers of that particular carbohydrate is given by 2 raising it to the power of n. This equation basically comes from a field in, math in mathematics known as combinatorics. For example, let's suppose we take our um, this molecule here, the aldopentose. We know that the aldopentose contains one, two, three stereogenic carbons, and that implies that two to the power of three gives us eight. So our aldopentose contains a total of eight, uh, eight stereoisomers. If we take the aldotetrose, we have two, so that's two to the two, that's four. If we take the simplest sugar, our aldotriose, this sugar here, we know it should only have two, one enantiomer and the other. And that's exactly what this equation tells us. Two to, uh, a two to the one, because it contains only one stereogenic carbon, is simply two. So we have the R or the, uh, the S enantiomer.